I went to college after I graduated from high school in 1940, and the following year, 1941, was Pearl Harbor. I had learned how to fly in my first year at Dakota Wesleyan. They had a civilian pilot training program. It was a um, course under which you had to solo after eight hours instruction. I'm frank to say I was scared to death when the instructor said, you're ready to solo, but I pulled it off all right, and my courage increased with each passing hour after that. So I decided when um, the war came that that's the place where I should go. Uh, there were 10 of us at this little school at Dakota Wesleyan who wanted to be pilots. We borrowed one car from the president of the school, one from the dean, and went to Omaha, where both the Navy Air Corps and the Army Air Corps had their recruiting offices. We were talking on the way down, you know, should it be the Navy, should it be the Army? One guy picked up a rumor after we arrived in Omaha that if you went to the Army recruiting station, they'd give you a free meal ticket to an Omaha cafeteria. So on the strength of that ticket, probably worth about a dollar, and an unsubstantiated rumor, all 10 of us joined the Army Air Corps. I tell my friends that's the cheapest I've ever sold out. So I volunteered just a few weeks after the Pearl Harbor attack. They didn't have enough planes, they didn't have enough instructors, they didn't have enough runways to take care of all the people that were volunteering. So I had to wait another year and it enabled me to get to my junior year before I was called. But when I got in the uh, Air Force, they sent us first to ground school. I was at the University of Southern Illinois for several months, learning mechanics, uh, meteorology, uh, maintenance, all these things. And they put us through a real tough physical training thing. I can't remember how many push-ups we had to do in a day, and pull-ups, and squats, and everything else. We were hard as rocks by the time we got out of that ground training. Then we went to uh, San Antonio, Texas, where uh, we had more ground school and more physical uh, training. My first flight school was Muskogee, Oklahoma, primary training and we moved every nine weeks till we were shipped overseas. Nine weeks of primary at Muskogee, nine weeks of basic at Coffeyville, Kansas, nine weeks of Malta engine at Pampa, Texas, then to Liberal, Kansas, where I learned how to fly a B-24 bomber, the biggest bomber we had at that time. Uh, then out to um, Idaho, where my crew was with me by then. We picked them up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and went to, to Mountain Home, Idaho, the second Air Force, and uh, practiced formation flying, practiced landings and takeoffs, practiced night flying, all of those things. Then overseas. The 15th Air Force uh, that I was with, was based in North Africa, but just before I went overseas, they moved up to Italy. The Americans had uh, taken over a large part of Italy, and our base was on the uh, west side of Italy, of the big Italian boot, at a little town called Sherignola. We uh, bordered the Adriatic Sea. You know, they brought us along step to step so systematically that I didn't know as much about the mechanical aspects of the airplane as I would why certain things happened. But I had a good engineer on board and that was his job to follow the mechanical uh, aspects of the plane. I think that by the time I was ready to fly my first mission, I had confidence that I was well trained and that I could pull it off. Now I should tell you that the uh, Air Blue as a co-pilot 
with an experienced pilot who'd been on a number of missions. I had a fellow by the name of Howard Serbeck, now deceased, a wonderful pilot. And he broke me in in the co-pilot seat. And by the time I moved over to the command seat, I felt well prepared to take over. I got the um, Distinguished Flying Cross, uh, not for flying, but for a landing. Uh, you, of course, you have to fly to land, so I'm, that's more of a joke than anything else. But we had lost three engines. We were hit heavily by flak. Down to one engine, we're losing altitude. And I said to the navigator, where's the nearest runway? He said, well, there's a little base in the Adriatic Sea just off the coast of Yugoslavia, but the runway is only 2,200 feet long. You need 5,000 to land a, a four-engine bomber. I said, well, 22 feet is better than going in the drink, so let's, I'm going to do it. I said, if any of you guys want to bail out, there'll be no criticism. You can bail out right, right over this island if you wish. It's, it's in friendly hands. Nobody wanted to get out, so I made the landing. When we hit the ground, I knew that I had to be right at the end of that runway, and as luck would have it, and maybe a little skill, maybe a little experience, I hit right on the end of the runway, and the co-pilot and I both got on those brakes and just rode them hard all the way down. The tires were just riddled, but we ground to a halt about 10 feet short of the end of the runway, and that's how I won the Distinguished Flying Cross. Nobody could believe that landing, but there it was. You know, I got to the point where I loved that old B-24. Uh, it was a clumsy, tough airplane to fly. It had that narrow uh, Davis wing. When the aircraft people first looked at it, they swore it wouldn't fly, but it did. Uh, the B-17 was the other four-engine uh, bomber used primarily out of England. We were based when I went overseas in Italy. But I learned to really respect that airplane. It would fly further and faster and carry a bigger bomb load than the B-17. The B-17 was easier to handle. Uh, it uh, could fly a little higher. So they each had their virtues, but I became a B-24 champion. It got me over the target and back home, sometimes in pieces, but we still got back 35 times. So I uh, developed great faith in that airplane. There was a mission that uh, came, as I remember it, about midpoint in my 35 uh, missions. It might have been the 15th or the 17th, somewhere there. And, and um, we lost an engine on the way into the target. You know, some of these planes had a lot of missions on them before I got there. But we decided to go ahead. We weren't too far from the target and drop our bombs on the uh, target. So I increased the power so we could fly on uh, two engines. That put a strain on the other uh, three, and over the target we got hit and lost a second engine. Then we really had to advance the power to fly on two engines. And as we turned off the target, uh, one of my crewmen in the back end of the plane said, I hate to tell you this, but we had 10 bombs on board, 500-pound bombs, demolition bombs, and one of them somehow jammed in the bomb rack, and we can't seem to get it loose. I said, well, I'm going to come down some from, alcohol, from altitude so we can cut down on the strain on the other two engines, but um, you're going to have to get rid of that bomb. This was difficult because you've got a catwalk about that wide, when you open the bomb bay doors, you look right straight down, you know, 15, 20, 25,000 feet, five miles. 
So it's difficult, but they got out there as I came down some altitude. I think I actually came down to about 10,000 feet and uh, the bomb uh, broke loose. It was a, um, a bright, sunshiny day and I could actually see uh, where, it, uh, where it hit. You couldn't always do that, but it lit right in the middle of a little Italian farmyard and exploded, of course. The house went up in the air, the barn, the chicken house, the tool sheds, everything that makes up a farm just went all to smithereens. I looked at my watch, it was right at 12 o'clock noon, and I figured, you know, here, they, they, I probably blew up an innocent farm family that were having their noon lunch um, and uh, thought they were safely out of the, the uh, combat area. I was really sick at heart at that. Um, we got back to the base and they gave me a cable that my wife had given birth to our first daughter, our daughter Anne. I thought, gosh, you know, I have a certain amount of rejoicing about this new baby. But I thought, we brought a child into the world, but I probably killed somebody else's children, maybe the whole family. Now, this is 40 years afterwards when I was thinking the same thing when my wife and I went to Austria, where I was to be a, a guest professor at the University of Innsbruck. And the television station in Austria, I think they just have one network, asked me if I would go on and talk about World War II. I did that and I told this story. That night, about midnight, an elderly farmer, Austrian farmer, called the television station and said, tell the American pilot the United States Senator who was on television tonight, that that was my farm that got hit. But you can tell him that while Austria went along with Hitler in the war, I hated Adolf Hitler. I didn't agree with anything he stood for. And I saw that bomber coming. It was a lone bomber, and the main force was way up above. They'd gone over a little earlier. And I got my wife and three children out of the house. We hid in a big ditch, and nobody was hurt. They're all doing well now, 40 years later. So after all those years, I get redemption for my... Uh, anguish over that mission. I don't mean to say I was brooding about it all those years. I had a busy life. But whenever I thought about it, that came to my mind. So I finally got relief from that emotional burden. The B-24 bomber that I flew was the most produced airplane that we had in World War II. 18,000 of those planes were built, but sad to relate, half of the bombers and half of the crews that flew with them never made it through the war. The fatality rate uh, among those bombing crews and planes was 50 percent. Half survived, half died in the war. So the fatality rate was double that of the officers on the land uh, war. We had heavy losses there too. Uh, second lieutenants, first lieutenants, a lot of those were, were shot down. But that rate was just half of the um, fatalities among the flying officers in the, in the war. It may seem hard to believe, but we didn't know what the fatality rate uh, was until years later when Stephen Ambrose wrote his great book called The Wild Blue, and then the subtitle, The Men and Boys Who Flew the B-24s Over Germany in World War II. And he did the research at the Pentagon to document this figure that half of the crews 
and the B-24s never survived the uh, war. I think if I had known that was the fatality rate while I was flying there, I'd have been even more uh, frightened than I, than I was. What, what would happen? You know, we'd go off with maybe, let's say, 350 bombers on a mission. 250, 500, whatever the day's order called for. And we'd see one or two or maybe three planes shot down. And uh, we'd say, well, you know, that's, that's too bad, but uh, that means look at all the ones that got through. You know? And what we didn't do is to count day by day, three this day, six another day, one another day, and it keeps going until by the time you get through 35 missions, only half the people you started with are still around. You know, I had the same crew all the way through uh, with one or two exceptions. My uh, navigator was killed about halfway through my tour of duty. He was flying with another crew that day and they were shot down and apparently he uh, didn't have time to parachute to safety. So we lost Sam Adams, our navigator. That was a sad day. He was listed as missing in action because they didn't know what happened. So we had that empty cot in our tent for the rest of the war. There were three of us there, the, uh, my co-pilot, Bill Rounds, the uh, new uh, navigator who took uh, Sam's place, uh, Carol Cooper, uh, and myself. Uh, we, um, we had a tail gunner exchange too. He developed some chronic air sickness and had to be uh, replaced. But uh, by and large, I had the same crew all the way through for the 35 missions we were required to fly. You know, as I got up to past 30, I began to count by single digits, one, two, three, four, five, and it's all over, I'm through. When I got up to two or three, still had a couple to go, I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be awful if after all we've gone through, uh, we got uh, hit. Uh, but fortunately, that last mission, which I think was the worst one we had, the Germans were pulling their aircraft guns back as they were driven uh, west by the Russians and driven east by General Patton. And so they, they'd pull those aircraft guns with them. They kept getting them more and more concentrated. We had 110 holes in that airplane. We lost our brakes. We lost our flaps. We couldn't uh, put the uh, landing gear down except by a very laborious cranking process that took quite a while. So when I landed, I had the crew uh, prior to that tie two parachutes, one on each side, there was a big stanchion down the middle, tie them there and throw them out the uh, side windows when we hit the ground. And they did that and the parachutes flared and that's how we got stopped without crashing off the runway at the end. The one thing that kind of um, put my mind somewhat at risk, I, I knew that every time we unloaded those bombs, there were probably human beings dying, but at least we had the Norden bomb site. We didn't bomb at night. The British would load up those big Lancaster bombers like you would a freight car took them up until they, they flew at night, took them up until they were over the city and could see the light and dumped them. We didn't do that. We had that Norden bomb site, and when we went after a tank factory or an aircraft factory or an oil refinery, our bombardiers were pretty good at, at zeroing on in, in on the target. So it meant that the civilians killed uh, were uh, minimal compared to the saturation type of bombing. So I took some consolation from that, but I also knew 
that there were people dying down there that we couldn't avoid from the so-called collateral uh, damage. The other thing that consoled me is that the 15th Air Force, at least during the time I was there, 1944 and the first half of 45, we concentrated on Hitler's oil refineries, whether they were in Czechoslovakia or Romania or Poland or Germany or Austria. And I'm telling you, we grounded the German Air Force. They just didn't have enough petroleum to function. One of the senior British generals wrote his memoirs. I don't remember his name now, but he said that he knew the war was over when one day in mid-1945, he flew up over the combat lines. And he, he noticed as he was looking out of his plane with the binoculars that there was a line of German tanks that were just crawling. Couldn't understand it. He had a way of calibrating the speed. So he had the pilot go down lower, and he discovered those tanks were being pulled by horses. They didn't have any gasoline. And he said he knew the war was over when that uh, happened. So I know that we had the consolation of knowing that we were shortening the war. We were saving American troops. We were even saving German troops, Russian troops by shortening that war. Uh, and I, no matter what is said about these bombing surveys, which showed that some of the places we bombed very quickly were back in commission, when you hit an oil refinery, you put it out of business if, you, if your bombing is at all accurate. So um, in that sense, I think I could justify the kind of precision bombing that we were doing. I believed 100% in the American war in World War II. We had no alternative. Hitler was gobbling up one country after another. France had been knocked over, the Scandinavian countries, and, and he was bound for, uh, to wipe out the whole continent, and I think he'd have done it. So I don't have any regrets about my participation in World War II. You know, it's interesting about war. We were delivering stocks of food that we had in abundance, medicines, um, bedding, clothing, everything. In some cases, the people we'd been bombing just a week earlier, but we knew they were destitute. And you know, after a war, you have to heal the wounds and help the sick and help the homeless. And we did that, so I, that was the way I ended the war. I then flew my crew and 16 meteorologists who were going to go back to the States and then keep going until they got to Asia. They were going into the Japanese war, which ended before they got there. But anyway, I took that load of men back with me across the Atlantic, and when we finally hit American soil near Boston, everybody got out and kissed the ground. One thing I learned in Italy, a country that's now probably the best fed country in Europe, is that in World War II, they were at the edge of starvation. The men were all up at the battlefronts, young mothers and young housewives trying to do the farming and keep things together, but it was, a, it was a pretty tough time. I saw young mothers out pawing through our garbage dumps early in the morning to take bits of food back to their children. Sometimes we'd see the same women on the streets at night selling themselves for a few dollars to keep uh, their body and soul together and for their children. So I think that began a lifelong commitment on my part to reducing hunger in the world. I persuaded Bob Doe, a Republican senator from Kansas, to join with me 
and we're now pushing what's called the McGovern Dole Food for Education and Nutrition. It was authorized by Congress, and we're now operating in a number of countries with school lunch programs. I want to see that program extended. It's under UN auspices with the United States in the lead. I want to keep that expanding until we reach every hungry school kid around the world. Almost three miles below this formation of American flying fortresses, there lies Marienburg in East Prussia. Up to this moment, one of the most important cogs in Germany's war machine. The specific target on which this lead bombardier is lining up his bombsite is the Fokker Wolf 190 plant. Up to this instant, this aircraft factory has been accounting for almost 50% of Germany's total FW 190 fighter assembly. Miles away. Tons of bombs rain down in a tight pattern of destruction. This, remember, is no area attack. It is an assault on one single target, and any bomb that falls outside that target has failed to achieve its purpose. The assembly of fighters in this Fokker Wolf factory has come to a sudden and violent end. To many, the bombing of Germany probably seems to be little more than a series of capricious adventures one attack unconnected in any way with the one that preceded it or the one that will follow it. It is easy for the average citizen to envision the positions of ground armies because of maps like these, which make the positions of the contesting forces quite clear. It is harder to express so graphically the progress of a bombing program. Yet there is a real line in this battle of Germany, not a geographical front, but an industrial one. In the British Isles, there are the Allied Air Forces. On the European continent, we have Regensburg, Marienburg, Bremen, Horsesleben, Barnumunda, and Kassel. These are the major German fighter assembly plants, and as such, are actually the center of Germany's industrial defense line. However, these are only the places where the aircraft is assembled into the finished fighting machine. Component parts for German fighters are made at Anklam, the Weser Flugzeugbau works at Bremen. The great Hederheim propeller works near Frankfurt. The aircraft tire factory at Hanover. The CAM ball bearing plant at Paris. And the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt. Obviously an assembly plant can't operate if other plants aren't building the parts from which the enemy planes will be assembled. Hulse produced 29% of all German synthetic rubber production and is in fact responsible for 18% of her entire supply of rubber, natural or synthetic. At Bosham, there's a great steel plant producing high-grade aviation steel. Heroya, up in Norway, is a great producer of aluminum and magnesium, metals which figure importantly in aircraft production. At Harm, there are great railroad marshalling yards having a capacity of 10,000 freight cars a day. Much of the tonnage handled here is closely connected with the manufacture, assembly, maintenance, and repair of enemy aircraft. The daylight bombing offensive against Germany is the responsibility of the 8th Air Force. Under the 8th Air Force are the 8th Bomber Command, the 8th Fighter Command, and the 8th Air Service Command, all of whom contribute to every bombing mission. 
but it is the Bomber Command which is charged with the actual destruction of the selected targets. The Bomber Command, with which this picture is primarily concerned, is divided into three divisions. Each division has a number of combat wings. Each combat wing, in turn, has three groups. This is the chain of command. Since the operations which we are to follow, there have been some organizational changes, but they are principally changes of nomenclature and have not affected the broad strategical and tactical purposes of the organization. For instance, what is referred to as Bomber Command in this picture is now the 8th Air Force. Weather is the greatest single enemy of the 8th Bomber Command, for here is to be found the most changeable, treacherous weather in the world. To keep the most accurate possible check on weather conditions all over Europe, the RAF has established vast communication and reporting systems. Weather planes such as this mosquito and our own B-17s are continually in the air in an effort to know in advance what the weather will be over Europe and the United Kingdom. Men like this supply a major portion of the data from which eight main weather maps of Europe and of the United Kingdom are drawn each day. In addition, there are four upper air maps and eight maps of a miscellaneous classification. In this room, all weather information is collected, coordinated by the RAF, and sent out by teletype to every responsible command. This is the weather section in the operations block at the Bomber Command. Here, the information gleaned from the weather stations is put together and correlated into weather maps. Accurate predictions must be made as to the direction and speed of the wind, downward and forward visibility, temperature, humidity, possible icing conditions, and probable atmospheric pressure at the bases, en route, and over the target. Upon the findings made in this room will depend whether or not there will be an American bombing of a German target tomorrow. This is the operations room of the Bomber Command. Here is where the wheels are put in motion for any American bombing attack. Right now, the officers you see are waiting for the commanding general's morning conference. They are the A3, or operations officer, the operational intelligence officer, a weather officer, and other members of the staff. What's the weather prospects today, Major? It looks like most of Germany will be pretty good, sir. But we have a warm front approaching from down here, which we do not expect to affect the bases until late in the evening. How's the weather at Anklam? At Anklam, sir, we expect two to five tenths of low cloud and small amounts of middle and high cloud above 18,000 feet. Visibility six to eight miles. How about Marienburg? At Marienburg, two to four tenths of low cloud a uh, little or no middle or high cloud, visibility six to eight miles. What will it be at Danzig and Gdynia? At Danzig and Gdynia, sir, two to five tenths of low cloud, two to four tenths of high cloud above 23,000 feet. Visibility in there about five miles. Sir. Give me the map of Anklam and the picture of the aircraft factory there. Yes, sir. Marienburg, the Fox Wolf Factory. Yes, sir. We will attack Marienburg with two combat wings, Anklam with two combat wings, the shipyards of Danzig with two combat wings, and the port facilities at Gdynia with two combat wings. That will require a maximum effort.
Now the various specialist officers then go into action. This is the operational intelligence section. Here are target files containing complete information as to the type, construction, and vulnerability of the targets. This data is gathered both from photo interpretation of aerial pictures and from confidential ground sources. On the basis of this information, the aiming point for the attack will be selected. The aiming point is a building or installation in the approximate center of the target. Here, operational research experts are minutely studying the architectural and construction details of the targets. It will be their duty to recommend, on the basis of studies previously made, the types of bombs and the proper fusing to accomplish the greatest possible destruction of the objective. These studies of the Arado factory at Anklam are immensely important, since the nose and tail fuses of the bomb can be adjusted to give varying degrees of delay between the time of initial impact and the explosion. For example, an improperly fused bomb would react something like this. Result, very superficial damage that may hardly even cause delay in production. On the other hand, here's what happens when a properly fused bomb strikes the same factory. Two bombs of exactly identical weight and explosive power have totally different effects because one was fused properly and the other was not. It is the responsibility of the operational research section to determine proper bomb fusing. Here, the commanding general and the operations officer are working out the overall planning of each of the missions with the staff bombardier, the staff navigator, and the flak officer. This is a complex business because of the multiple nature of the attack. We'll attack Aklum one hour before we attack the other targets. That should draw most of the German fighters on the Aklum force. The Aklum force is big enough to take care of itself. You mean along the same course, sir? No, uh, send them a little south. Uh, they'll act as a better diversion. This would be the best place across the coast from the standpoint of pilotage. But, sir, the... Uh... Black concentration at that point is quite heavy, the heaviest along the coast. We could rather move them a little further south, where the general suggests, and they would not run into flak difficulties at that point. How is that for the navigation viewpoint? Well, that's a very good line, Paul, sir. All right, we'll cross at that point, and you adjust the flight times accordingly. Take care of it, Darrell. Yes, While this is going on, the various liaison officers stationed at Bomber Command Headquarters are busy keeping their respective commands acquainted with the course of events. The closest liaison is maintained with both the RAF Fighter and Bomber Commands, the Royal Navy, the 8th Fighter Command, and the 9th Bomber Command. It is through these liaison officers that requests will be made for the necessary fighter support, diversionary effort by the medium bombers, air-sea rescue patrols, and so on. Officers at Fighter Command immediately look up plan number 2340 to find out what part the fighters are expected to play in the next day's operations. Similarly, the 9th Air Force is informed that Bomber Command intends to lay on plan number 2340. It will be the duty of the mediums to attack enemy airfields at a time that will cause maximum interference with German attempts to intercept the heavy bombers. Right now, weather officers are getting ready their forecast for the general's late afternoon conference where final decisions will be made. Yeah, should be okay. Good enough. Does your morning forecast still hold? Yes, sir, there's practically no change in the situation, and we still expect the base weather to hold up for return. Send out the field order exactly as planned. Yes, sir. Get me the first, second, and third divisions on a conference call, please. Already with your conference call. Go ahead, please. Can you scramble? Okay. Over. Okay, over. Over. Okay, there's a mission tomorrow. Maximum effort with five task forces. The first task force, comprising six groups of the first division, will hit 3948. 3948. Secondary, 8731. 8731. Last resort, 9009. 9009. 
The second task force, comprising five groups of the third division, will hit 6848. 6848. Secondary, 6424. 6424. Last resort, 5381. 5381. The third task force will comprise four groups of the second division, which will hit 6424. 6424. Secondary, 5381. 5381. Last resort, any industrial target of importance in Germany. Okay. The first and third divisions will each dispatch one air... The field order now goes over the teletype to all interested units and command. The first step has been taken in the sequence of events that will finally result in bringing our planes over the targets and discharging their bomb loads. Command has conceived the mission and laid out general plans and routes. Division now plans in detail what command has ordered. The actual time of assembly of the various task forces is determined. The combat wings are assigned to their specific task forces, and the routes from assembly to rendezvous points and the target are chartered. Many considerations go into the selection of the routes. Here is the commanding general of the first division, which you will remember has two targets for tomorrow, Anklam and Gdynia. Another control point here for the northern unit, zero plus 40 minutes. Uh, the other friendly... From, from, that, from that timing, where will that put our northern force at the time that our southern force hits the IP? Uh, the northern force should be about the east coast of Denmark at that time, sir. It looks like we're going to catch all the fighters on the southern force, aren't we? Looks very much that way, sir. Well, I think we'd better bend that uh, route around so it's headed towards Berlin. If we can pin those... Uh, German fighters down in Berlin until we can get started home, they'll never catch us. At the second division, the target for tomorrow is Danzig. Danzig, eh? That's fine. How many ships do we have tomorrow? Well, sir, if you recall, General, on our last mission, we had heavy battle damage, and now all those aircraft are repaired yet. Call up the wing commanders and have them put pressure on the groups to get their maintenance crews to work on these ships tonight and get every possible airplane on the line in the morning. The third division which will have for its targets Marienburg and Gdynia. Looks pretty good, sir. We're going to be right over a lake there for a good checkpoint of the turn. We're going in against the sun. The sun will be at our back, sir. Defenses at the target. Uh, Major Frost, uh, what about the flak defenses? Sir, at the upper target, there are 24 guns. That approach is good. The lower target isn't defended by heavy guns. No heavy guns, whatever, at Marienburg. None, sir. The division's operations officer bases his precise plans on aircraft and crews available at the various groups. He then calls the combat wings to give them advance information before the field order actually arrives. Operator, give me uh, combat wings for conference, please. Okay. Travel, over. Okay. Uh, over. Okay. Over. For tomorrow, first bomb division will be called on for two task forces. First task force will be made up of Two combat wings uh, on targets three nine four eight three nine four eight eight seven three one eight seven three one seven, last three, resort one. nine zero zero nine. Nine zero zero nine. group in this task force. Scramble. Uh, okay, ready to scramble. Over. Okay. Over. Over. Uh, there'll be a mission tomorrow. Uh, and I want two groups from each combat wing. The target will be primary 6424. Four, six, four, secondary 5381. Five, three, eight, the last resort will be any industrial uh, target of importance in Germany. Okay. Right. There's an order coming through. The 3rd Division will furnish eight groups. First and second wings, comprising the second task force, will hit 6848. 6848. Secondary, 6424. 6424. Last resort, 5381. 5381. Last resort. Bomb load. 
500 pound GPs fused, one tenth nose, one one hundred tail. One, one tenth, tenth and one nose, one one hundred tail. This is operations of the combat wing, a purely tactical unit having absolutely no administrative functions whatsoever. How do you intend to make it? Sir, we'll assemble over Molesworth. Problems of takeoff and assembly are the particular specialized function of this organization. It is the primary business of the combat wing to get the airplanes of its group into the air at the proper times and to get them assembled once in the air. The field order requires that we provide the second combat wing and the second air task force. 89th group will lead, 81st group will be high, and the 63rd group will be low. Uh, that means that Colonel Whitten will lead the combat wing on this mission? That'll be fine. The bomber command has asked for a maximum effort. That means every available plane is to be gotten into the air. Uh, Ramsey, this field order has called for 3,100 gallons for the ages due to the distance. Now, they've called for maximum bomb load. How about that for the weight? I think we'd better put eight bombs in the ages and 12 in the Ds. That keeps us around 65,000 pounds. How about the CG? CG is well forward, and I think it'll work out very well because we've been down low for a long period of time. All right, we'll have eight in the ages and maximum in the Ds. Most of the groups are going further than an American bomber has gone before. Combat wings must work out precisely the maximum bomb load in relation to the required gas load. Decisions made in this and other matters are added to the division's field order and passed on to the groups. The ultimate tactical unit to the men who get the planes in the air and fly the mission. On the basis of the alert telephone down to the group by the combat wing, the various agencies necessary to get the planes airborne on their mission wheel into action. Intelligence, operations, weather, signals, group navigators and bombardiers have the grave responsibility of passing on and making clear to the combat crews the vital target and route information furnished by Bomber Command and Bomb Division. The proper information folders, maps, weather maps and charts, and photographs have to be selected by the various group officers and then the information therein passed on to the crews. In dispersal areas, ground crews are getting their planes in condition to fly the mission. The normal work of keeping an airplane fit for operation is enormous, even in peacetime. When you add to this already great job, the element of battle damage, the problem becomes gigantic. Engines, wings, Propellers, controls, wiring, fuel system, oxygen system, the thousand and one elements that go to make up the complex mechanics of a heavy bombardment plane all must be kept in perfect shape. The failure of any one of them on a mission can easily mean the loss of the plane and its personnel. Or at best, such a failure will cause the plane to abort. That is, return to its base without having reached the target. It was originally estimated that about 37.5% of planes on hand would be effective at one time. However, the maintenance and repair has been so magnificently performed that sometimes up to 50% of planes on hand have been effective. Ordnance is already at work getting the bombs in their racks and loading ammunition onto the plane. These are 100-pound incendiaries. These are 500-pound general purpose bombs. And these are 1,000-pound GPs. bombs have to be placed in their racks very carefully. One bomb sticking in its rack through careless placement 
might make a whole mission useless so far as that individual plane goes. Three o'clock in the morning. All over England at this exact moment, American air crews are being roused from their sleep. Okay, fellas, roll out. We have a mission this morning. Breakfast in half an hour. Captain Kirk, Captain Thompson, Lieutenant Buska, Ackerson, Alloway, and Hawker scheduled to fly. We'll stop it up. Three o'clock. This is a hell of a time to get a man out of bed. Oh, God. Come on, you drips. Out of bed. Breakfast in half an hour. Come on, Nick. Rise and shine. <laughs> All right, you dodos. Let's go. This is it. Okay, fellas. Let's go. Come on, Swifty. Get it up. Let's go. Go, you guys. Hit the deck. Breakfast at four. Oh, breathing at five. Let's go. That's fine. Just when I had a 48-hour pass coming up. Oh, good deal. Can't, you guys. You're ruining my beauty sleep. Through the cold of the English early morning, the combat crews go to their mess. They have no idea where they're going yet, but they know they'll be taking off in about four hours. Jerry's will be today. What do you think, Dob? They'll be shooting at us. Sometimes I don't think those Jerry's got proper respect for us. Well, what do you expect, Buster, the way you shoot? Jerry, look who's talking. You couldn't hit a cow in the flank with a bow fiddle. Yeah, but how about those two Jerry's I slapped down over Swainford? I'll tell you what happened there. They heard that I was on a tail gun and they fainted from fright, that's all. And so it goes. The 4,000 men who will go on this mission all know it will be a rugged deal. For some of them, it's their first mission. Others are veterans of many. Happy to get through. Now, at all the groups in the bomber command, the air crews are assembling in the briefing rooms to learn the target for today. Okay, boys. This is the briefing room of the 303rd group. Here in a few minutes, the nature, locale, and route of today's mission will be made known to the men who fly it. The target for today is Ankman. Specifically, you are to destroy the Arado factory. This plant manufactures aircraft components, principally wing and tail assemblies for the Fock Wolf 190s. The parts are then shipped to New Brandenburg for assembly. I cannot stress upon you too much the importance of this target. If it is successfully destroyed, it will have a very serious effect on German
70s aircraft production. Lights, please. Your IP is on the northwest side of New Brandenburg. Your heading on your run-up will be 45 degrees true. Immediately after your turn, you have an aerodrome on your right, almost directly north of the town. You should be able to pick out Friedland, six miles to your right and halfway between your IP and the target. Along this route, you should be able to see the main line railroad and the main road. From Friedland, the main road moves in toward your run-up and goes into Anklin, but the railroad terminates at Friedland. Shortly after passing Friedland, you will see a peculiarly formed wooded area on the right of your course. From here, pick out the aerodrome slightly southwest of the city and the intersection of the main railroad and the Peen River just outside of the town to the north. Night target map. Your target is across the railroad beyond the town, in the area formed by the bend of the river. And now a picture of the target. This group of buildings here is your target. This building will be the aiming point. If your bomb pattern is concentrated in this area, it should very effectively knock out the factory. Lights, please. At the 379th, the intelligent briefing continues. These groups will bomb from an altitude of 13,000 feet. We feel that this low altitude will be equalized by the element of surprise which is with us and it should ensure a thorough and complete priming of the target. Another task force is hitting the FW-190 assembly plant at Marienburg. If the two missions are successful, 65% of Jerry's remaining FW-190 production and assembly facilities will be destroyed. At the 384th. Other forces are attacking submarine yards, aircraft assembly plants, and units of the German fleet at Danzig and Gdynia. If these attacks succeed, they will destroy 13.5% of Germany's remaining U-boat construction and will destroy or immobilize a large section of the German Navy. The overall result of all four attacks will be to show the Hun that his efforts to protect his key industries by moving them to the east will be unsuccessful. It will show him that we will seek out his industry and destroy it wherever he places it. At the 351st, the intelligence briefing is completed. Your secondary target this morning is the air park <coughs> at Tutov. This contains a Falkwolf assembly plant, <coughs> a bombardier school, and you'll love this. It's the country club of the German Air Force. <laughs> Should you be unable to bomb either of those two targets, then in that case, you'll attempt to bomb the last resort target, which is the Hankel assembly plant at Rostov. This is the only complete Hankel unit in North Germany. It should be easily identified by the airfield adjoining which has six intersecting runways running from 1,000 to 1,600 yards, and they're full of nice, fat, juicy hangles. <laughs> A weather officer briefs the crews of the 305th group going to Gdynia. The synoptic situation today is this. We have a high-pressure system centered over northwest Europe, up here near Finland, extending southwestward down across the British Isles causing an influx of south and southwesterly air going up in this direction. Hence, causing little or no cloud in the area up there and toward your target. There are no fronts to affect your route today except a frontal system off to the west which will cause an increase of medium and high clouds as you come back across the North Sea. Lights, please. At takeoff time, there will be nil to three tenths low clouds, also a layer of high clouds above 23,000 feet, four to six tenths in amount, also a middle layer of clouds in there between 10 and 12,000 feet. These medium and high clouds decreasing out over the North Sea to three to five tenths each in amount. 
The low clouds will increase as you go out toward the North Sea to three to five tenths. Base, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 feet. Tops, four to 5,000 feet. There will be some fog patches over England. Visibility, one to two miles, except in those fog patches, 500 to 1,000 yards. Visibility increasing rapidly out over the North Sea and the remainder of your route to four to six miles. The high clouds uh, continuing three to five tenths, uh, and also the middle clouds on toward the target, decreasing to nil at the target. Low clouds continuing three to five tenths, decreasing to two to four tenths at the target, base 2,000 feet, tops 5,000 feet. Visibility four to six miles. The temperature at bombing altitude minus 26 degrees centigrade. The freezing level on your route out 12,000 feet over the North Sea with light, light rime in the middle clouds. As you return back to base, that freezing level will lower to about 7,000 feet, continuing light rime in your middle clouds. Now on the return route, weather will be very similar to your route out, except your clouds increasing in amount as you proceed back across the North Sea. Based on return, visibility four to six miles. A flak officer briefs the 389th group of the second division going to Danzig. Now, gentlemen, this morning, because we are going to cross the Danish coast at such a relatively low altitude, we've planned the route so as to avoid as much flak as possible. At any rate, any flak that you do encounter will be merely a deterrent in nature. Uh, however, you can expect heavy flak batteries at a place where we make landfall here at Namindagab, about a mile south of Kors. Also, there are known to be other heavy batteries eight miles south of Kors there on the coast at Penn. Other batteries are known to be located here at Corsor, 20 miles south of Kors, on the island of Skellum. From then on to the target, you will have very little flak. Now, while you're crossing the coast and when you're over aerodromes and cities in Denmark, uh, you are advised to take evasive action. Now then, when you get to the target itself, your anti-aircraft fire from the ground will be known to be supported by fire from naval units. Now, for those of you who have never been fired on by a naval unit, I want to add that naval units can put up a hell of an intense barrage, and you want to look out for it. An operations officer briefs the crews of the 94th Group of the 3rd Division. This group is leading a formation to Mariansburg today. The 88th will be high group, and the 764th will be low group. Bomb load of each ship will be three 1,000 pounders, fuse one tenth nose and one one hundredth tail. Get that, bombardiers. You'll also carry five M47A incendiaries. You'll have full Tokyos, 1,000 gallons extra. Takeoff will be normal, assembly 1,000 feet over the field. After takeoff and assembly, proceed up this line to this point. This will be your combat wing assembly line. You'll leave the coast at this point here, that's Splasher 15. Let's not have any stooging around over England, it's a long haul. The 57th combat wing will follow us today at a three mile interval. Now to the 95th group. Uh, B-26s will be hitting the Leal area and the lowland uh, at approximately zero hour minus 40 minutes. Uh, one group of B-47s will strike the, the warden area and join us for escort on the way out, joining us at approximately this point here. Uh, all other forces are using approximately the same route today. Uh, just one point, and that's the Anklam force will probably pass us coming out as we're on our way in. Uh, you should see plenty of air activity. Let's hope that most of it is out. <laughs> the climb will commence at the English coast, climbing at 150 miles an hour, 100 feet per minute. Uh, we should reach bombing altitude approximately the Danish coast, and under no circumstances should the Danish coast be crossed at less than 12,000 feet. Uh, we will drain Tokyo as soon as possible. Uh, we should have plenty of gas. We figure approximately 400 gallons overload. At the hundredth, the operations briefing is completed. Fly loose formation today with groups echelon to the right, still a point 75 miles from the enemy coast. 
our normal combat form, combat wing formation will be assumed. For visibility, everybody use all this land. The Royal Navy will be out patrolling with sea routes, so any crews that have to ditch will probably be rescued very quickly. The commanding general of Bomber Command asked us to put out a special effort today, so let's give it to him. The commanding officer of the group invariably has a few words to say. Men, the going's going to be rough. You're going to have to bow your neck in there and stay in there and pitch every minute. Now, gentlemen, this is the type of target you don't want to have to go back after the second time. If you fly a good, tight formation, get a good, dense pattern on that target, we won't have to. This Anklin crowd down here they pull most of the fighters off of us. However, that's just a guess. So particularly for you gunners, you've got to be on the ball from the Danish coast onto the target. Flak will be heavy, probably accurate, but you've been through worse before. Remember that your biggest enemy is still the single-engine fighter plane. Now, you bombardiers, take your time in going in on your releases. And don't allow the flak to worry you. It's merely to break up your formation. Now, if you get in any trouble up in this area, remember you can always go over to Sweden. Get down. It's a neutral country. And it's close over there. Could be rough. I don't think it'll be too bad. And whether it's easy or rough, I'll be sitting out in front taking the, the whole works in. The main briefing over, the pilots, navigators, bombardiers, radio operators, gunners, receive separate specialized briefings. These briefings are very technical and very thorough and are held so that every member of the combat crew will understand exactly what he can expect and what is expected of him. Any lack of thoroughness here might very well result in the failure of a mission. As dawn breaks over the English countryside, it finds the ground crews still working grimly in an effort to get every plane in the air that is scheduled to be dispatched. These men take as fierce a pride in their planes as do the air crews. To each of them, it is a personal tragedy, reflecting in some way on their capabilities when their airplane is forced to turn back without having completed its mission, or when they have been unable to get an expected plane ready in time for a mission. It's getting on to the time when the combat crews go to their planes. Here they are in the crew room, putting on their flying clothes. Clothes and equipment especially constructed to ward off the intense sub-zero cold which they will encounter so shortly. All air crew members receive escape kits containing equipment that will help them get back to safety if they are forced down in Germany or in occupied territory. The pilots, co-pilots, Navigators and bombardiers are also issued battle folders containing the maps which will be of such vital importance to them in the prosecution of the mission. The men turn in all personal papers and valuables, which might serve to give the enemy information in case of capture. The combat wing having been assembled, they now move on to make rendezvous with the rest of the task force. In this case, another combat wing.
This plane from the force which is to attack Anklam is now approaching the Danish coast and the formation is subject to enemy attack at any moment. It is now 10.30 hours, and Denmark has been penetrated to some distance without any great opposition as yet. So far, there has been only some light and inaccurate flak at the coastline. Some flak guns have opened up on us. From on, the Anklam formation has to contend with constant German fighter attack from all levels and all clock positions. During this time, the gunners aboard the fortresses knock down fighter after fighter. However, the gunnery of the forts, no matter how sensational it may be, is only to ensure the successful performance of the mission. It is not the job or purpose of forts or liberators to seek out action with enemy fighters. They merely defend themselves against enemy fighter attack so that they can destroy their target and bring their crews back safely to their home bases. An anxious moment comes now for the lead navigator and bombardier. The formation is approaching the initial point. 
That is the point where the wing will turn off and make its bombing run on the target. Upon proper navigation to this point may rest the success of the entire mission. Pilot and left waste cutter. We're over the IP. Release fires. Waste cutter to pilot. Roger. Once the combat wing has reached the IP, it breaks up into three component groups. For the wing formation is too unwieldy for a unit bombing operation. As the IP is reached and the lead airplane of the lead group is about to make the turn, it fires two red flares, spaced five seconds apart. Then the group makes its turn onto the run-up. The low group goes on straight ahead for 20 seconds, then makes its turn. The high group proceeds for 20 seconds beyond the low group's turn, then it turns onto the run-up. The most critical defensive period in the mission has begun. The wing to accomplish most efficiently its primary purpose, the bombing of the target, has sacrificed its mutual defensive firepower, and the groups are thrown on their own. Now the crucial moment is almost here, the moment around which the entire mission revolves. Bombay doors open, the group is committed to its attack. No evasive action may be taken until the bombs are away. And at this time, the formation is most vulnerable to attack, both from flak and enemy fighters. Marienburg, an hour later, the second task force comes over the target. Bombs away! The third task force comes over its target at Danzig. Bombs away! The fourth and fifth task forces arrive over the harbor area of Gdynia. Bombs away!
It is standard procedure for the group leader to inform Bomber Command the moment the target has been attacked. Bomber Command, in turn, promptly informs the Commanding General of the 8th Air Force. After getting bombs away and closing the bomb bay doors, the groups can now defend themselves again, at least to the extent of evasive action against the flak and fighter attack. The lead group flies a straight course for 15 seconds before turning off to the rally point. The lead group then proceeds to the rally point at an indicated airspeed of 155 miles per hour, making S-turns, meanwhile, to permit the trailing groups to catch up. The lead group crosses the rally point at a height 1,000 feet lower than bombing altitude. The succeeding groups will close with the lead group as quickly as possible to regain the defensive combat wing formation. The following groups need not necessarily pass exactly over the rally point in regaining wing formation. In the meanwhile, the marauders take off to fulfill their part in the day's operation. They bomb the airdrome at Wonstrecht, one of the most important of the enemy's fighter bases. This blow by the medium bombers is timed so as to provide the maximum interference with the enemy's capacity to intercept our withdrawing heavy bombers. Last off are the fighters. Their great speed will enable them to reach the Lawarden district in a short time, sweep the area clear of enemy fighters, then give the heavy bombers withdrawal support from the enemy coast home. At the fields, it's getting on towards the most nervous of all times. The estimated time of return. Everyone who stays behind sweats out this period at the end of each mission. Here at the control tower, at the dispersal areas, at the Red Cross, at the officers' club, everywhere on the field, the one thing paramount in everyone's mind is that the group is due back. to attack the target. How many have returned? One, two, three, four, five, 15, 16, 17, 18. 18 dispatched, 18 returned. 23 dispatched. Twenty-three return. However, there are other groups which weren't so fortunate. Eighteen dispatched, seventeen return. Twenty dispatched, nineteen return. Twenty dispatched, fourteen return. Nineteen dispatched. 18 return. 20 dispatched. 10 return. 18 dispatched. 8 return. 
Flares dropped from aircraft signal the presence of wounded aboard. These airplanes are given priority in landing. The airmen are home, but their job isn't over yet. Before they can go to their billets for a well-earned rest, they must first undergo one of the most important phases of any mission, interrogation. It is highly important to question the crews at the first possible moment after the mission, while their impressions and memories are still fresh. Crews who have anything of immediate importance to report go at once to the hot newsroom. Hello, boys. How are you? Well, kind of long, not too tough. Best bombing job we've ever done. Good, good. Somebody in trouble? Uh, yeah, we saw a 1B-17 go down there just before we made landfall. Where was that? Well, that was at uh, 5240 North. 5240, uh, oh, yes. One degree, 50 minutes east. Oh, 0150 oh, east. Yes, and what time was that? Uh, that was at uh, 1524. And was that a G-fix? Uh, that was a G-fix, yes. And uh, we had the radio operator get on the MFDF section. He sent in the coordinates of the fix. Good. And I had my radio operator turn his IFF to emergency when we saw it go down. Okay. And what happened? Well, uh, the ship went down, uh, apparently under control, and uh, saw it hit the water. Yes, I was looking through the glasses, and I saw two dinghies come out, and ten men, apparently all okay, Major. Good. And what altitude were you? Uh, we were at 5,000 feet at the time. Okay, anything else? No, no. Set them up for a cup of coffee. Just waiting for you, boy. Thank you. Third division, please. Hey, R. Smith, I got a B-17 crew down the dinghy. Thank you, all. Sixteen group, please. Special aircraft priority. Flight control, please. Uh, Sixteen, uh, bomb division here. We have a B-17 reported fixed at 52 degrees, 30 minutes north, one degree, 30 minutes east. 
That's right. He was seen to ditch. Yes. He was seen to ditch at 15:24 hours by the reporting aircraft. Two dinghies were seen to break out, and ten men got into them. The reporting aircraft was at 5,000 feet. Yes, that position's an MFX. Okay, 16. Thank you. In one way or another, scores of our crews are saved by air sea rescue from the English Channel and the North Sea and returned to combat service. Aside from human values, a trained fortress crew is even more valuable than the plane they man. And the work of the Air Sea Rescue Unit has been of enormous value to the 8th Air Force. The hungry crews are fed enough to hold them until they can be interrogated and get to their regular chow. These men are from the groups that went to Anklam. What time did you go over the target? At uh, 11.43 hours. We went in at 12,000 feet. Did you get your bombs on the target? Yeah, yeah. Right. What about enemy fighter officers? Well, that's something we'll sit around discuss. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, let's get some of the details. Where did it begin, Paul? Well, they first jumped us at 10.30 there, just off the Danish coast. And how long did the attack continue? They stayed with us to the target and until 13.27. Then at 13.45, we had another group attack and stayed until 14.05. We had a couple more attacks, and the last one was at 15.26, just off the Danish coast coming out. And about how many enemy fighters did you see? Well, I don't know how many of them might have been repeated, but I saw six or seven of myself. I couldn't keep track of them, sir, but I counted about 60 packs. Well, I stopped trying to count when I got to 50, sir. Well, do you think it would be accurate to say, then, that your ship saw between 65 and 80 enemy aircraft. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. What type of enemy aircraft did you encounter? Oh, yeah. Well, from what I could see from the tail, they threw the book out. FW-190s, ME-109s, 110s, 210s, Dornians, even JU-87s and 88s. I saw a couple of Fock Wolf 189s, at least two Hanker 111s. What positions did they attack from? Oh, they came from all over the place. The fighters are pressing home their attacks from three to four hundred yards. Would you characterize these attacks as determined? Determined? Oh. Brother, you can say that again. No, I think those guys are really trying to shoot us down. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. How would you describe the enemy fighter tactics? Well, I describe them as murderers. <laughs> if they usually attacked in formation to queue up about three or four hundred yards away, 12, 13 single engine fighters come barreling right through the formation. How did the twin-engine fighters react? They stayed out to the side and above, just out of the range of our guns and charged cannons and rockets at us. Then they'd queue up and press home a regular fighter attack. What caliber would you say the cannons were? My guess would be 37 millimeters. What do you think, Adam? Yes, what about the rockets? They shot a lot of them. I didn't actually see any hit our formation, but they weren't doing us any good. I saw one of them blow a wing off the 17 below and ahead of us. They started to spin in. Any shoots? No, sir, I didn't say any. Where was this? Over the target, right after we talked about bombing. Did the fellows notice any distinctive marking from the enemy aircraft? Yeah, yeah, yeah I saw so. quite a few. Well, there are a number of FW-190s, mostly yellow noses, some white noses. No red noses? No, I didn't see any. Boy, those yellow nosed boys really come in close, don't they? Did you see that one come right on our left wing? Yeah. I saw a 109 with black and white diagonal markings under the wing. Black and white? Huh? I had white nose. All right. Yeah. Getting back to those rockets, I believe that Jerry can reload his rocket guns from inside the ship. I think he can. That would be my guess, too. I saw at least nine bursts from rocket guns on one ME-210. Nine bursts, all right. Talking about 210s, there was one that came in and shot a cluster. It looked like clay pigeons to me. I'd say, those things looked like baseballs to me. Can you describe that more fully? How did they react? Well, they didn't look like baseballs. It was more like streamlined and smoked all the way down, but they didn't explode. Didn't explode, huh? No. What about planes? Uh, I knocked down two. They were making attacks about 5 o'clock level. Yeah, I saw them. One of them blew up in the air, and the other one went down in flames. The pilot of the second one bailed out. That was at 11.44. We were right over the IP. Were any other guns firing at these planes? No, sir. These were my babies. 
Any more? Yes, sir. I got one destroyed and one problem. <laughs> I knocked a 210 down right over the target. The plane exploded in the air. I got a burst of a 110, and it started down in flames. I couldn't see whether it went all the way down or not. We are under constant attack. Bombing results and enemy fighter reactions are only one phase of the interrogation. The enemy's anti-aircraft defenses, their concentration, and their accuracy are also matters of great interest to the interrogators. The group of the second division, which went to Danzig. How would you describe the flak and route to the target? From the coast of the target, it was uh, meager and uh, inaccurate height and deflection. Over the target, it was still meager, but pretty accurate height and deflection. Is that how the rest of you fellows would describe it? What about on the way back? Well, it was meager and inaccurate, except now when we crossed the coast. They threw up a box barrage that was pretty accurate as to height. In fact, it was good at the altitude, but the deflection was a little off. The first burst hit about 100 yards ahead of the lead plane, and uh, we felt the concussion of it, right? We got a couple of flak holes and fuselage right around my gun position. Any other battle damage? A couple of flak holes in the nose. First, the 303 in the number four engine uh, got an oil line. What was your altitude when this box barrage almost caught you? Uh, 21,500 feet. Did any of you notice anything unusual or peculiar about the flak burst? No, it looked like the same old black flak to me. What's the six we have seen? Also valuable to the interrogator is any intelligence that might be picked up by the crews en route to or from the target. Such observations may be completely incidental to the mission, but can prove to be of great value at another time when another target is being attacked. Let's find out what the force attacking Marienburg discovered on their way oh, uh, to and from the target. This smoke screen at Danzig, where did that emanate from? Well, it looked like to me it was coming from off of floats and boats here with smudge mm -hmm. spots on them, actually just a little ways off the coast. Yeah, honey, they were shooting it up from the ground, too, and it get up so high and uh, burst mushroom. and mushroom out. Like mushroom out. Yeah. Would you say it was effective? Well, we didn't pass right over the city itself, uh, so we couldn't say definitely, but it looked like to me it'd be pretty doggone effective. It's all good. Yeah. You see anything else? Yeah, there's a new airport about two miles below Danzig there, south of Danzig. What it look like? Pretty large airport with grass runways and a lot of construction at the south end. I seen another one there at the uh, park. It seemed like it's building runways and uh, some buildings, new buildings right there. Quite not to be hangers. Okay. Now, how about military installations? Did you see any of those? Well, uh, south of Stadov in East Prussia, we uh, saw some installations that might have been fortifications. Uh, they were large, rectangular buildings with red tops. Yeah, there were two rows of four. Four buildings each? Yes. Good deal. Now, you see anything else? As soon as interrogation of the men is finished, the interrogation forms are checked, and general statistics on the group's part in the attack are compiled. All right, let's get going on this report. Okay. Uh, B, number of aircraft dispatched. 20 of which. C, number of aircraft attacking the primary target. 20. Hello, I want the A2 duty desk. Hello, this is Norgan 492. Got a flash teletype report for you. You ready? The organizational flow which we have observed throughout this picture has now begun to operate in reverse. Information obtained from the crews is evaluated in divisional critiques, conferences in which all responsible group and divisional officers carefully inspect the detailed record of the mission, discuss any failures that may have occurred, and plan to prevent their recurrence. After a particularly large or important operation, there will be a command critique, with the 8th Air Force Commanding General presiding. Here in the dark room, the strike photos of the targets brought back by the returning planes of the group are developed and printed with all possible speed so that experts of Bomber Command can assess the damage done. Coming in from planes of every group participating in the various raids and interpreted and appraised by trained photo interpreters, these pictures will give Bomber Command an excellent idea as to exactly what parts of the various targets were hit and how severely. Here as seen in these pictures taken the following day by photo reconnaissance planes, Severe damage has been inflicted on all the major 
and most of the minor buildings of the Arado factory at Anklam. This is a strike photo showing how Danzig looked during the attack. Very extensive damage has been suffered in the harbor area. Here is an annotated PRU picture of Gdynia as it appeared after the attack. And near miss is seen on the liner Deutschland type. The transatlantic liner Stuttgart does not appear in this picture, although she was seen afire and in the hands of tugboats immediately after the attack, as these strike photos reveal. Aside from the Stuttgart, several ships in the South Basin have been sunk or damaged, including the liner Oceania. Shore engines are also heavily hit. At Marienburg, the PRU photo discloses that the damage was exceptionally severe, almost every building having been destroyed or seriously affected. General Arnold has characterized this attack as the greatest example of precision bombing on record. Other targets will be as thoroughly destroyed. Today, while the invasion armies are pressing the Battle of Europe, the Battle of Germany continues. Day by day, whenever weather permits, heavy bombers roar out over the heads of the advancing ground forces, blasting away systematically at vital industrial installations hundreds of miles to the rear of the enemy lines. Now, in contrast to earlier days of strategic bombing, when forts and liberators fought their way alone, fleets of long-range fighters, Mustangs, thunderbolts, lightnings, convoy the big bombers all the way to their targets, targets which may be anywhere in German-occupied Europe. The flood of supplies so necessary to the survival of an army or a nation, synthetic rubber, steel, food, fuel, textiles, this flood is gradually being reduced to a trickle. And finally, even this thin, inadequate stream will die away. Then the German armies in the field and the German workers on the home front will have no food for their stomachs, no clothing for their bodies, no metals for their machines, and no fuel with which to run them. Then the Battle of Germany will be won, and with it, the Battle of Europe.